And so this is in terms of detailed coverage, this is where we are ending at. And that's a um, aspect of this is what you're seeing in the homework, which is long this week. And um, that's where th we are leaving things at. And I think I say in one of these lectures that the first time I covered this in physics for I actually did try to cover the finite well potential and <laughs> quickly realized that, oh, this takes a lot more time than I thought it would. Um, so it's something that we don't quite cover. And I think I entertained for a bit if I might try covering it this semester and I don't think we will, but what I do want to cover instead is just talking through qualitative features of what you see with the finite square well. And I think if we are just talking about it with uh, help of simulation, I think that's something that we can definitely do without, you know, uh, things being uh, much too complicated. Um, so, so that's what I wanted to do today, maybe for first to 10, 15 minutes or so. And I'm hoping to have somewhere between 30 to 40 minutes to work on work on a portion of a problem set 13. So with that intro, um, let me just uh, explore this uh, um, simulation illustrating quantum bound states. Uh, one part of this that we will never get to is many wells. Um, I guess this kind of relates to uh, chapter nine material, solid state physics that we are very explicitly skipping. So, I mean, you are welcome to look at it, and but I'm not gonna look at it <laughs> right now. Um, and depending on uh, where we are at time-wise, I think we might look at the two wells uh, solution. This is one that, uh, potentially useful to, yeah, superposition state. Um, it's a very interesting context to, to talk about stationary state versus uh, not the stationary state. So one well. Um, I, I've, with any simulation, one of the things I like to do first is to build a level of intuition for the simulation because um, sometimes there's a principle called um, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's, uh, I guess, uh, the discussionary principle where it matters the most is where you have a complicated thing, almost like a black box, as in it's uh, different from when you're working through algebra by hand. When you're working through algebra by hand, Ideally, you know every step of the solution process and there's no mysterious thing that you don't know about. And um, what's the danger there is that it could fail in some unexpected ways. Um, and simulation is kind of like that. You didn't code this Java simulation yourself. The programmer could have made the mistakes and <laughs> maybe you are relying on this simulation without being fully aware of those mistakes. Um, so <laughs> what I wanted to do was um, um, just to play with this simulation enough to gain a level of confidence that it works in the expected ways, at least under the conditions where you feel like you know how the simulation should behave. So the situation that we are familiar with, and we can compare this simulation to in hopes of kind of gaining a level of confidence with the simulation that it looks like it's working the way it's supposed to, is the infinite square well. That's the that's the situation that we are familiar with and we have analytical solutions for, and we can kind of compare the results too and see if uh, what we get matches, what we should expect to get. So with the infinite square well, what you have is you have a square well, but the difference is the potential barrier at the edges of the square well, they go up to infinity. So you can think of it as a very deep well. And in this situation with the infinite square well, um, the allowed energies, I'm just gonna um, recap this thing here. The allowed energy levels, which is given by the kinetic energy, 
uh, momentum squared over 2m, and this allowed values of momentum are given through the allowed values of wavelength that would fit in as a standing waves. And um, trying to do this in my head, <laughs> let me write that. A lot of wavelengths are uh, two, 2 L over N. And so the momentum is H over wavelength. So this should be um, H squared. Um, oh, uh, N goes on the numerator. N squared divided by 2 L squared, two times two uh, or two squared, four times two is eight. So 8 ml squared. So these are the allowed energy levels. And the feature that's really the most important here is that the energy levels go as uh, proportional to n squared. So when you diagram the energy allowed energy levels here, if this is my E1, then I expect my E2 to be uh, three units above this level. So at so that E2 is uh, four times E1. And so it goes as N squared. So we expect the spacing to get larger. The next one should be, so from four to nine, it should be at one, two, three, four, five units above. Uh, this is the third energy level. So I expect to be able to replicate some of these features with this finite well if I set it up in a situation where it resembles the infinite square well better. So the way to do that would be, uh, let me put this, um, oh, so this is already at zero EV. And I guess I can just to make this high uh, potential barrier height go as high as the program will let me. Oh, configure potential, can I? Okay, 20 EV is the highest I can fit it to. And let's see how the energy levels compare. My first allowed energy level is at 0.32. Let's look at the second one. It's at 1.28. Okay, oh, let me do this <laughs> with some help of calculator. So with the infinite square of potential, if my ground state is at 0.32, what I would expect for the next energy level is this times four. 1.28 is what I would have expected for an infinite square well. And I see that, oh, I'm actually there. That's pretty close. I mean, within the precision, I see that is it. Okay, let's look at the next energy level, 0 0.32 times uh, nine. That's the, the third energy level, uh, two point, uh, okay. There now I'm beginning to see a little bit of difference. Instead of 2.88, it's a 2.87. Okay, let's look at the energy level. Uh, 0 0.32 times the next, uh, so four squared, that's a 16, 5.12. Okay, okay, the, and the discrepancy is beginning to get larger. But for the first few levels where you could argue that compared to this energy level, there is not much difference between infinity and 20 EV, I'm seeing that the result I'm getting kind of matches what I would expect from um, the infinite square well. So let's see if uh, we do this. Uh, so to explore some of the features of a finite square well, let's see how we can um, make this worse. So I guess one parameter I can control independent of the barrier height is the barrier width. So um, the question is, okay, is this going to begin to look less like infinite square well if this is a very narrow well? Or, um, or if it's a very wide well. And I think uh, offhand, I'm not quite sure which way it would go. So I could see argument for both ways. So you could argue that if it's a very broad well, then when you look at the, the when you look at the overall picture, like overall shape of the well, that it being both very, um, uh, so, the broader shape of the well would make it look like look shallower on the overall scale. But I think if you make the well narrower, what they will force it to do is it'll make the energy levels E1 actually higher because a narrower well means uh, shorter wavelengths that are allowed. So you could uh, argue that these energy, 
these energy levels, uh, they will get closer and closer to the, the barrier height of 20 EV. So, so this is where simulation helps. My intuition isn't really helping me um, whether uh, these agreements with the infinite square well approximation would hold better or worse uh, with respect to uh, how, so let me just do this. I'm gonna change the width so that it's double uh, at 20 nanometers. And yeah, so you see more states of feeding because um, as I was saying, the, the energy levels themselves are uh, lower. So uh, in the same uh, space of energy levels, there's gonna be more states that are allowed to fit. So going from E1 to E2, uh, so 0 0.09 times three uh, should have been 0 0.27. So I think it got worse. Um, and going from, so zero, or let me try to go from here because the 0 0.09 that concerns me in terms of uh, precision of numbers alongside other things. So let me do 0 0.34 uh, divided by four for the second energy level times nine. So if uh, this was uh, supposed to go like infinite square well, then E3 should be 0 0.765. Let's see. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I think this is 0 0.9, 0 0.09 number is probably 0 0.95 or something that's getting rounded down. Um, all right, uh, let me do this. Uh, 0 0.34 divided by four. Okay, 0 0.085. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, A5, okay. Um, so I, I guess uh, here's one way I can compare. I can uh, see the, the discrepancy from the infinite square well, square well to finite square well comparing um, at, um, I guess, I think in the previous configuration, one point, so the highest energy level I saw was E7. So let's do it this way. Um, I'm actually just curious for myself. So let me just do this and then we'll try to move on to other <laughs> topics. Okay, uh, 0 0.32 times. So if it's E7, then it should be at seven um, squared or uh, this times 49, uh, 49. So 15.68 compared that to 15.17. Let me subtract. 15.17 and um, divided by the, the theoretical or the, well, let me, mm, let me divide by 15.17 because that's the true value, 15.17. Uh, so I have a percent error of 3.4% at the seventh energy level for this parameter. Okay, let's uh, try this. I'm gonna broaden it to double the size uh, width of two meters. And because of this limited precision, I'm gonna do this. I'm going to take the second energy level, uh, 0 0.34 and um, 0 0.34 and divide it by four to get me what I think is the closer E1, 0 0.085. And then let's uh, compare at the seventh energy level, E7. Uh, what we have here, 4.2 with the infinite square well prediction. So infinite square well would predict this number times 49, seven squared. So 4.165 and I have 4.20. So let me, um, oh, I thought before the finite well level was lower. So, all right. Um, so minus 4.20 um, and then divide by 4.20. Um, so, so yeah, we do this broader well, at least at the seventh energy level, what you're seeing is the amount of error is less. In fact, it's in the other direction. I think that might be a rounding issue. Um, it has a 0.8% difference compared to 3.4. So I think, uh, uh, so, you know, comparing this uh, finite square well solution with infinite square well, um, this kind of comparison, it's at least giving me enough, um, enough confidence that if I'm comparing the, the energy levels and the solutions here with 
the infinite square well, at least at these lower energy levels, far from the, the energy barrier at 20 EV, that these are following the pattern that I would expect from infinite square well. And um, if I make this narrower, like a width of 0.5 nanometer, then you begin to see results that deviate quite a bit from um, infinite square well prediction. So here, you know, E1 to the third level, it should be this times nine, so about 10 EV. And it's quite different from that by like 5%. And, um, and you see also that if I configure potential here, uh, let me bring the level sum down so that I can grab it at least. Uh, and I put it at 15. And you see that as I bring this level down, it actually changes these energy levels. So there is, this, um, so, you know, th there's a thing that happens near the barrier. So right now this state is barely bound, barely below the barrier. And as I bring it down and at some level, that bound state goes away. I don't, I no longer have the particular bound state. And, um, and as I bring this lower and lower, even though I'm nowhere near these energy levels, you can see that the a lot of energy levels themselves are changing as I bring this barrier height down. And this is a um, difficult part of uh, solving for the Schrodinger equation that it's a differential equation. So what happens in this outside the barrier region, uh, how quickly the wave function is decaying, that affects the exact a lot of energy levels. So um, yeah, now one thing that I thought, um, so here's a question I'm asking myself, can I have this energy level so low that this uh, potential would have no um, bound state at all? And, oh, I think this potential will always have at least one bound state. So this is where I am as close to, well, you know, 0 0.1 EV. This is like, uh, can I even zoom in here? Um, so I have this uh, um, finite square wall that says finite as I can make it. The barrier depth there is 0 0.1 EV. And I think I still have a one bound state. And um, I think in upper division physics, actually they do, um, uh, they do make you, there's a theorem you can prove. Uh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> so I think the theorem you can prove is uh, one relating to uh, like a delta function potential. Never mind. So here, I, I think I have uh, ruined this uh, well enough. I made it narrow enough, which will force any bound stage to have higher energy. And I made the barrier low enough, uh, which will kind of reduce the abilities of this potential to confine state that this potential right now has no bound states at all. Now, if I made the barrier height a little bit higher, okay, then now I have one bound state, but um, I can make that go away as well. Um, so, so yeah, this is, uh, um, so with a finite square well, so this is the regime where um, um, the kind of solution you get looks nothing like uh, your infinite square well potential because this is a quite different situation from infinite square well. And even if I were to make this height a little bit higher, um, so this being a finite square well means um, this uh, narrow width actually begins to affect things because the, the first allowed energy you would have under the infinite square well is has already such a high energy that um, that you can kind of see it here. This uh, wave function takes uh, quite a bit of distance to decay to uh, close to zero. So, so this is a finite square well and the kind of interesting things that you could see with a finite square well and some of the features that you can see that kind of resemble um, the solutions you have seen in infinite square well. The difference basically is, you know, this is a sinusoidal looking thing. How quickly do they go to zero at the barrier? Uh, I, in the, so I guess I'm a little bit over the amount of time that I wanted to spend on this. Uh, let me just show you one thing. Um, so this, uh, the states you are seeing here, they are called stationary states really for a reason. Um, 
And I think right now it's difficult to, for you to really see because it's, it's just so darn stationary that like what else can be there? It's because it's right now displaying probability density. Let me have it display wave function. Then we can talk a little bit more about uh, in what sense these energy eigenstates are stationary. Because when I'm displaying wave function, it, um, Wait, let me make it fast. It actually doesn't look that stationary. It oscillates, you know, it, it has time dependence. So why is it, why are we calling it stationary state? It's easier to see if you show more parts of the wave function. So right now I'm displaying the real part and imaginary part of the wave function. Okay, that also doesn't really show how in what sense these states are not, are stationary. Okay, let me uh, make it so that it's showing instead of, so, you know, wave function is complex and any complex number function is two parameters and you can decide those two parameters in two different ways or two or more ways. One is to do it this real and imaginary part that's almost like a Cartesian representation. Or you could do it with a magnitude and phase uh, that's uh, like a polar representation. Magnitude is how um, the, you know the magnitude of the wave function at those positions, and phase is the fa the complex phase factor, which would uh, uh, represent the angles in the the complex plane. So um, with this representation, let's see here, and you will see things do change over time, and what is changing over time is the phase, not the magnitude. And if you kind of recall back to the representation of real and imaginary part, you can kind of track it here. If you imagine doing the real part the squared plus the imaginary part squared and then that square root, um, that part actually is constant. And that's what this uh, magnitude and phase representation shows. That the phase is changing over time according to the time evolution dictated by the Schrodinger equation, the time dependent one, but the magnitude remains the same. This is the, something that holds for all stationary states, all energy eigenstates. Now, we can construct something called the superposition state, and that's where fun things can happen. So it says create a superposition state by setting coefficients such that, okay, let me look at here. So this is my first state. My second state is, oh wait, where's my E2? Oh, E2. Oh, I see. Um, I think I know what it's showing. Um, so uh, let me deal with uh, one of the higher state, uh, higher energy states, because at E1 and E2, these are such a, well, maybe I can do that. You know, let me do that. So uh, you see these kind of double of energy levels. It's because with these two wells that are pretty close to each other, um, uh, you have a, like an even state that's E1 and odd state E2, E2 or sorry, by even, I mean even symmetry with respect to the center of the whole potential wave. You know, it's even on reflection and this is odd on reflection. And I think it's the even states that have lower energy than the other states here. So, um, and both of the even states either by themselves. So, you know, this is all stationary state, even state, or the other state are, they are stationary states. And uh, with the other states, with this representation, what you're seeing is the phase on this part is uh, pi or 180 degrees different from this side, which is why you are seeing the color jump so suddenly. Okay, that's as interesting as um, stationary states are gonna get. Now, what I can do is I can form a superposition of this odd, okay, let me go back to this, of this odd state and this even state. And by superposition, I simply mean adding these two components together. And when I have a both a, a psi one and psi two dis uh, displayed, you can kind of guess what you will get when you add these two states together. So let me form the superposition state here. Uh, for psi two, I have one, and let me put in one for psi one as well. So when I do that, normalize and apply, okay. 
So this is the normalized superposition state of those two energy eigenstates. And you kind of see a, a wave function that you could describe as being a, a kind of a, you know, in this double well setup, if you put in a particle into one of the two wells, this is kind of the wave function that could represent it. And watch what happens as I let the time run. Over time, this wave function, do I want it, this to go a little faster? Um, over time, this wave function moves to the right side of the well. And over time, it actually moves to the left side of the well. And um, this is a kind of a superposition bit phenomenon. Uh, there's actually a, a really close analogy between what you see here. And I think you saw a demonstration of this when we were doing interference way back with optics. I had a physical demo of coupled oscillators, coupled pendulum. And when you set up an oscillation in one pendulum, over time that oscillation moved to the other pendulum. And um, I wanted to show that demo because that's a kind of physical classical oscillation demo that relates to this kind of quantum mechanical phenomena. And um, yeah, uh, and I, I guess I'll leave that here. Um, you can play with it and you can kind of see if we, if you show real and imaginary parts, can you show that better? Oh, maybe not. Um, <laughs> not any more clearly. It's kind of a bit phenomenon. So the reason the superposition of these two energy eigenstates won't be a stationary state over time, if you plot probability density, it does actually change over time. It, um, you can make a, uh, draw a direct connection between the frequency at which it is uh, probability density oscillates between these two and the bit frequency between these two energy eigenstates. The frequency at which it is oscillates back and forth, you can relate that to the energy difference here of 0 0.02, you know, associate a frequency through a Planck's constant, and you'll get um, something like that. So, all right, I think I spent more time on this simulation than I really had, so, uh, so I'll end it here and, um, Again, this is kind of uh, uh, downside of the limited amount of time we have in this class, uh, which is we can um, we don't have enough time to um, uh, explore this more thoroughly. So they, you know, if you want to some level of guidance that that is given here is um, let me just clear all the drawings is um, you know in this simulation and you know part C is where I don't quite have. Um, detailed descriptions, but what I am referring to here is uh, it's able to demonstrate the difference between states referred to as a stationary state, energy eigenstate, and the superposition state of different energy eigenstates, which can show time dependence on probability density and all that stuff.